Commissioner Ed Rothstein. I uh, welcome our colleagues from across the parking lot, the Board of Education, along with all of our CCPS uh, friends and neighbors as we're having this joint uh, Board of County Commissioners and Board of Education CCPS meeting. I think um, we're in a pathway to great success during very challenging times. And I think we're gonna talk about some of those challenging times um, while we go through this agenda and allow us to open it up for other discussions that we want. But as we always do, why don't we take a moment uh, to pledge and a moment of silence. It's pretty cool with the acoustics here in the uh, pledge. That was pretty yeah. strong. And I know you're going to be describing this being a uh, brick from East Middle, and I appreciate that. And it's going to go in a, uh, a place of honor. So thank you very much uh, for this gift uh, to us. Um, we have a lot of folks in the back. There's Ted, okay. And also, don't know if you know uh, Deb Effingham. You know her from uh, budget. We're, we were able to acquire her in the front office as our deputy um, administrator. And uh, while Roberta's somewhere in Europe being yes. safe on two wheels. But um, definitely welcome um, you. And uh, my opening remarks, and I'll just uh, Hand it off to my colleagues quickly and then to uh, you as well, Madam President. Is um, going, we're, we're starting to go through uh, MACO, the Maryland Association of Counties. Our conference is in middle August, and today we had a legislative subcommittee on the topics we're going to discuss during the legislative season, and there were 42 topics. Um, brought to our attention, and we got it down to, I think, about 26. The intent is to get down to four or five their, like prioritized topics during the session. Now, I'm on the board of uh, Maryland Associated Counties, so this was like the first stab at it. Now, taking that, sending, uh, giving it to uh, my colleagues um, for their insight and ideas, thoughts, comments and moving forward. The reason I'm bringing this uh, up is one of those, as you would expect, is education. And all those things wrapped around education. Um, recently, we had a, a meeting, we being the board of Maryland Associated Counties, with MABE and the state. Um, I think it was about three weeks ago. Nothing really came out of that meeting except for the fact that we have a long ways to go in a relatively short period of time and that we are committed to working together. Um, the voice of that's gonna be us and you, it's not us or you, and uh, I think that's, that's an important piece of this. So uh, we have a long ways to go in a very short period of time. Um, and uh, perception is reality to a large part of our community. So. Our intent is to take away some of those perceptions, put in the objectiveness, and make sure that that is the reality for our community um, so they understand what what is moving forward and what's not um, because there's just so much happening. Um, with that, if uh, any of my guys, colleagues, want to make any comments or thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, with reference to MACO, uh, I know the county, our Carroll, Carroll County is heavily involved with that organization, and I, I certainly hope they can make some headways with this issue of the blueprint. Uh, 
I know we spent a lot of time and energy on it, but if this isn't one of those issues where they can at least take into account all the different counties and the very bare fact that Blueprint helps some but hurts others, uh, I, I really, really hope that we get some positive results out of that, that particular group. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here. I think it's great that we're meeting. I think that you're probably well aware of the fact that uh, the general consensus of the board is that we need to start the budget process for FY25 now, and, and that's really what we've done. Have we taken some concrete steps to do that? No, but we've, we've had a couple briefings and we're taking a look at the numbers because we can't wait until January or February. I think you'd all probably agree with that. Um, so again, looking forward to the briefing today, um, and as we go forward in this budget process, which we all know is going to be very important because they all are, for me personally, it's really going to boil down to in terms of the school system. Uh, you know, what do we need and what do we want? Sometimes they're two different things. But particularly on this issue of uh, blueprint, I mean, as elected officials, you know, if we are dealing with mandates, dealing with legislation that we know may actually hurt our school system, what are we going to do about it? And that's something that I hope all of us can, we can work through. Uh, I, I think it's nuanced and I think the verdict's still out on what that particularly looks like but again I think it's imperative that we do the right thing for the children of the Carroll County Public School System so for me personally that's that's where my head's at as we move forward and uh, again thank you everybody for for taking the time to put things together this morning uh, this afternoon oh, thanks thank well said uh, Tom I appreciate everybody being here today um, I'm often reminded about how our community recognizes that our boards can meet and discuss topics which for all of us, I think is an incredible positive as times, you know, some organizations, we can't do that. Uh, you know, they recognized this in the past year with the Board of Commissioners stepping up and funding the 99% of the budget request that you all gave us. Our constituents are expecting us to be balanced partnerships and incompetent financial stewards as positive action for the good of the community and education as a whole. Both sides must, must continue to work to be effective leaders on behalf of the public we serve. To do this, we must enhance our collaborative efforts by ensuring there is always accurate and trans transparent information shared during our discussions, and we must improve how we interact on behalf of the public in our meetings so that we deliver positive results for our community. And just to echo on both of my colleagues' points regarding MAKO, you know, we are hopeful, but obviously, as we all know, hope does not resolve or, or is an answer. But I think the reality is we collectively have to work as a community. I know in the past, and I'm not wanting to speak on too much of the past today, but there's been perception, as Commissioner Rothstein pointed out, that by some in the community that we all don't work together. We have to work together. We don't have a choice, both for Blueprint and as the community as a whole. So that's my goal as we all continue this conversation and move forward, whether it be future budget discussions or any other topics. We have to work together. And I look forward to that with all of you. Thank you. Yep. Well said. Uh, Commissioner Vigliotti, Jim. Did he forget somebody? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> just making sure that. Not yet. Go ahead. Well, I'm just very briefly to echo everything that's been said already. Thank you very much for agreeing to, to meet with us today and proceeding with the, the process that we have in front of us. I will leave myself out of this as a matter of politics, but I'm extremely blessed to be working with all of you and these gentlemen up here as well and everybody to the left of me as well. Um, I know I've brought it up in the past and at some point in the near future I'd like to talk about putting together that joint letter between both our board and your board I guess as a I guess an initial formal protest or, or indication that the blueprint uh, funding that we're required to provide for the plan that's supposed to be implemented is just simply unrealistic and I think that uh, you know owing to speaking off of what Commissioner Gordon had mentioned uh, with respect to the community uh, th that is something that they're looking for, to know that the Board of Education and the Board of Commissioners are working together and that in areas where we do have over overlapping interests and we are on the same side, we need to make our voices heard about these sorts of things. Uh, and so I'm more than happy to, to put myself forward to help work on that letter if everybody's interested in putting together such a letter. And not only having the, the heads of either of our boards sign it, but all of us sign it. You know, this, this really is a concerted effort, and uh, I know that the public perception has sometimes been in the past that the Board of Commissioners and the Board of Education have kind of been abrasive with each other. That's certainly not the case now. And in a situation where we are able to work together to achieve some common end or to attempt to achieve some common end, I think we certainly can. You know, again, I'm, 
I really do feel blessed by God that everyone who's serving on this board right now is, and everyone over here is as well, and that not just the elected officials, but our administrative officials as well. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, meeting with us today. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And uh, Commissioner Kyler, Kenny? Thank, well, thank you. No, um, I can't forget one, you. One more <laughs> comment about MAKO. Um, in in uh, the, the meeting I was involved in, they mentioned that 90%, I think it was, of bills we opposed did not pass. Correct. And sometimes in Annapolis, that's as important as what does pass, is what you can keep from passing. Uh, it's a few right now I wish we could have kept from passing, but we didn't. Um, and again, thank everybody here. This is great. And I think a symptom of hopefully how we're working together and will work together, the agenda probably was put out more, more later than it would have normally been. And a couple people asked me, and I said, well, that's because it's not controversial. We're not fighting about it. I kind of don't care what the agenda looks like as long as both of us agree with it and we show up. I didn't feel that same way in the past. And speaking of my past, before Austin uh, <laughs> does, I, I want to thank you for the county on grooming me for four years for this job. I don't <laughs> curse anymore. I'm better prepared. <laughs> you don't curse but you're, anymore? No. You're still telling little white people. No. <laughs> no I guess he not. still <laughs> may <laughs> once in a while. I, yeah, I know you. So, um, yeah, a few four-letter words. But anyway, <laughs> Madam President, uh, it is now, uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of the board, I would like to thank the commissioners for hosting us with, up with the meeting today. I'm glad to see that we are following through on our commitments for regular meetings, and that's so important, and I'm glad we're doing that. I hope that the excellent working relationship we have established will continue, and I think people are starting to see that in the county. Um, we will still have many issues and challenges facing us, as we all know, and as we've seen in the past, when our two boards communicate and work together, we are able to do what is needed. And I thank you. And I have to say one thing on Blueprint. At this time last year, people thought Cindy and I had six horns, three noses, big ears, and were nuts. But only one county is not in trouble coming up this year in funding the Blueprint. And everybody is starting to see that we weren't crazy. We were telling the truth all along, and people were actually uh, starting to listen to us. And uh, so now we have a lot of counties on our side, all but one, that can afford this. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that people, uh, boards of education, legislators have seen this. And this is something that is going to be a struggle for all counties in the state of Maryland but one. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dorsey, we'll start down with that then. Okay, great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and um, again, thanks for hosting our meeting this afternoon, commissioners. We're um, very glad to be a part of our meeting today. Um, as I spent my morning hours, I was involved in a, a meeting with our MABE Board of Directors, and I understand that they go was meeting um, this morning, and I know there had been a joint meeting in the past, and I think you've already hit upon um, something that I will again emphasize. Um, as we go forward, we have to go forward together um, because it's not a, an us versus them, but in order for us to, to make Blueprint and all of our other initiatives work, we have to really um, work through those um, items together. So I appreciate your willingness um, to listen your willingness to um, sort of problem solve with us, and your willingness to just join us um, on this journey as we go forward together. So thank you very much, and I look forward to our dialogue this afternoon. And, and you guys over here probably don't know this. I don't second a lot of motions in our meeting. That's because of Dr. Dorsey. I had to look at her and get permission before I could second a motion. <laughs> She's so not there, so I don't know how to nod? get permission. I'll give you a nod today. <laughs> I thought it was because you can't hear, but that's a different thing. <laughs> 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 can't hear. Okay. Uh, 
Um, just want to echo a lot of the comments that have already been made. Thanks, thanks for having us here today, and thanks for joining us on a on a regular basis. I know that we decided not to have the last meeting just because of timing with all the other budget discussions that were going on, but I think it's just imperative that we get together on a regular basis um, because this is how we really work together, be collaborative, and get things done. Um, I think that our our hearts and our intentions are all in the same place, which is fantastic. Um, I think together we can get a lot accomplished. Um, totally agree that um, you know we need to start early on this year's budget process because it's going to be probably one of the toughest, if not the toughest, uh, one that we've ever had. Um, at least as a school system, um, and they're thereby for the county as well. Um, so really appreciate you guys being true partners in this. Uh, we may not always agree on every step of the way, but I think the end goal is the same for both of us. So um, I, I think it's just great that we can have these these discussions. Um, so start early, start often, right? Um, and Joe, I completely agree with the approach of the joint letter. I think that that's something that we need to um, work on and and leverage the fact that other counties have now come around. Um, Marcia, you had said, you know, a year ago people thought that we were crazy and that we were behind the eight ball and, you know, we were too slow in trying to figure this out and what, uh, you know, and that's why we were in trouble. And people have realized, like, no, we were actually the ones that were ahead of the game, right. understanding what this truly meant and we've brought others along with us and they're saying, oh, now we get it, and yes, there are significant issues, so we need to leverage that across all the other counties um, in the state. So I think together, you know, we can, we can get this done. It's gonna be a tough road, but, but we can do this. And you know, and that's staggering to me when you mentioned that only one county is prepared for this. I figured it might have been a couple, but just one, that really it's is one. staggering. Our county. Yes, we were leaders. We were leading the pack mm -hmm. and getting the word out. But yeah, that's just, one. Just a, you know, just real quick a reminder that, because I know I shared it before, because it's only been a short um, seven, eight months when our now governor, Moore, had the MAKO directors together and said, who of you have been a part of the development of the blueprint? And one person out of 16 of us raised their hands and because he was on the committee from Queens Anne County, nobody in the state was a part, as far as the leadership, was a part of the development of Blueprint. And yeah, so. Nor, nor were the local boards, yeah, right. nor was MSDE. None of them were part <coughs> of developing it. And the, 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 the part, at. yeah, that is where we're at. Unfortunately, it was, it was developed uh, in a vacuum. Um, it really was with no mm -hmm. understanding of what the implications were of executing it. Um, and, and I think the, the last thing I wanted to say was that I think we, we also need to um, involve the delegation as, as early and as often as possible because you know we're going to probably be pushing for waivers and things like that and we just need to make sure that we're all on the same page with them as well. So you're proposing maybe a joint joint meeting? <laughs> we've had we it, have, we've possibly. Had we, we've had those in, we before. tend to do them in the October mm -hmm. time yeah. frame. Maybe yeah. we have more than one of those, or maybe we have it a little bit earlier than we normally have so that we can prepare for, yeah. for the upcoming session, rather than it being a mad scramble yeah. at the last minute to try to get some things in their hands, that it be much more um, planned out and prepared ahead of time. I like that idea. And it could be, it could be the next one where, you know, July, August. It could be like a September, mid-September. This way it's after MAKO. Um, you know, the legislators will have time to start chewing on things. Uh, it's our intent to get bond bills to them quicker uh, this year and starting now. What are some initiatives? But uh, we can send an invitation um, together to our delegation and uh, yeah, just have another joint meeting like we, because we did it last year, I thought, yeah. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good idea. All right, Todd. That's good to have you. Um, so, you know, thank you again for hosting. Um, our partnership is extremely important. Showing all of you a planned, detailed budget request annually um, and showing where every dollar of taxpayer money is going and showing the accountability piece. And I think that's extremely important for, um, you know, our voters to understand and see that we prove everything to you and we show you everything many times a year. <laughs> um, 
but working together uh, for the county is extremely beneficial and I'm, I'm glad that we are able to have um, open dialogue together and you know have the good conversations of you know, what is better for for this county as a whole so thank you thank you mr. Whistler Again, good afternoon. Thank you for having us today. It's, I really appreciate these dialogues. Um, I can't really add much more than what's been said, but I will tell you, for me, there are three things, you know, considering Commissioner Vigilotti's comments, three things that really come to my mind with regards to trying to change in Annapolis, one of which um, is the 75% compensatory ed spending requirement. That mandate alone will force us to move teachers around the system and just kill the class sizes in our county. The student-teacher ratios will be horrible, and that will directly affect our academic performance. So we've really got to convey to stakeholders across the state, and again, this is something that's gonna affect every jurisdiction. Um, another requirement we really should focus on eliminating is the 60-40 teaching requirement for educators. Um, giving them the well-deserved pay increases they need and should get but insisting they work less is crazy in my mind. It's absolutely irresponsible. We have one of the best performing counties in the state academically, and the 60-40 teaching split will probably require us to hire 125 or more teachers to fill those gaps created by that non-teaching time that we can't let them teach. I don't know where we're gonna find the money, more or less the people, to fill 125 vacancies. What is that? I 60-40 teaching split. One of the blueprint right. mandates says that a teacher cannot teach more than 60% of the day. Uh, and, and, the, and the reason behind it is very, very good in that it helps increase planning, it helps create collaboration. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. But when you look at our academic standing and the performance that we have, it will just incredibly kill us financially in that we have to find people to fill those gaps. It is just incredibly irresponsible in my view. Do we average 75-25 now, maybe, or where are we, you think? Nick, where are we? At the, at the secondary level, um, at the high school level, for example, there's four mods a day. Teachers typically teach three mods and have one planning mod, so we're closer so at, the, at the high school level. Um, however, at the elementary level, we are not, we are nowhere near close to, to, to that 60-40. That 60-40 they want at elementary, middle, and high school? Every teacher. Right. Every teacher. Every single educator. Right. How do you do that when... And I apologize, just as an elementary school teacher, I thought you're teaching like your class and your class is there from morning to end. I mean, you just well, get a 30 minute lunch period free and you get oh, your planning period where the kids are at specials. specials. But again, the other piece like that you're alluding like that. to is that again, if we would have to build in like some professional development time in their day, um, again, you know, they would not be in front of their classes at that point. They would be doing professional development kinds of activities. Someone else would have to be with those kids. I'm sorry. Pardon me, Dr. Dorsey, I'm terribly sorry. Um, but it, it's additional staff, and the, the concept, especially at the elementary level, of a student having a teacher, in some instances two teachers during the day, could change, and it could be a, a more of a shared collective approach amongst teachers. So students will be working with, with, with additional staff to be able to meet that, uh, meet that requirement. And there's a dollar cost, obviously, associated with this. Has that dollar cost been calculated for Carroll County? Yes, it's, yes. It, it's actually something that will be covered today. Okay, uh, I apologize. Okay. And then the other issue is that when you look at all the teacher-producing programs in our state, the colleges and universities, I looked at it myself on the Maryland data uh, link system. We produce about 1,500 teachers a year. 24 jurisdictions looking for all these new teachers that the 60-40 split will require, it's just not realistic. And what's gonna end up happening is we're gonna have to hire so many people that are not qualified to fill those seats, and I do not wanna see unqualified people in front of our students. And then the last thing I think we need to focus on is eliminating this requirement for assistant principals to teach 25% of the day. It is just unbelievable to think that we can put more on our APs to have them teach 25% of the day. It's just not possible in my view. So um, we do have, at least I have personally, a few things in my mind that I'm sure the staff can bring in more, but you're right. Together working on this, working on a joint letter, feeding this information to our legislators, getting an early start, because um, again, it's a very short 90-day cycle in the legislature. 
they have to change these things legislatively. And look, we have to at least consider waivers. I get why these, some of these mandates were in place because of the frivolous waste in other jurisdictions in the state. But our county is always top three in math, science, ELA. We have proven performance. We need the flexibility at the local level to, to pull the levers, to not increase class sizes, and more importantly, not to put unqualified people in front of our kids and maintain high academic success in our county. But I really appreciate you getting together with us today, and I look forward to, to, to future sessions. Right now, we're not putting unprepared teachers in front of our kids as of today, correct? I, I would say Ms. Herbert is correct, um, but we do have more teachers on conditional certificates in our classrooms than we ever have in the past, and that's because, as Mr. Whistler said, we don't have enough uh, teachers graduating from Maryland colleges to fill all of the um, vacancies, and our HR department goes and recruits in, in many different areas, not just Maryland, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult uh, to fill all the positions we have um, with those that are certificated. So we, we do have many more conditional certificates, and that worries me because, um, you know, will that affect our academic achievement? It, it, it could, mm -hmm. um, and we want to put the best people in front of our students mm -hmm. possible. Dr. McKay, can you put a, a quantity on that? What, what would you say the percentage of, of conditional teachers would be? Um, I would look to Ernesto for that. That would be interesting yeah. to, to have that. That, that yeah. along with what is defined as conditional? So um, folks who have not um, passed the certification assessments that need to be taken um, or have not completed the coursework that they need to complete for a teaching certificate. Was the last question part of that is how many that are conditional actually become certified? Some do. I don't know. I don't have any numbers Just on curious. that. Curious. Yeah, some do. I can speak to a personal situation. I got my teaching certificate um, from the Troops to Teacher Program AmeriCorps. And so I had a conditional certification when I taught in Baltimore County for two years, and I was given a two-year window to complete my certification. So that's an example of where someone may be uh, not, con not certificated, but then they, they're given a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. But that's just, uh, but again, I don't think it's, I don't think we have a very high percentage of un uh, uncertified people in our, in, in our schools, but I, I'll, I'll defer to staff on that. And, and I would say the bigger picture issue here is that um, fewer and fewer people are choosing to go into education as yeah. their career choice. And until that changes, these issues aren't going to change. Um, and I know that that's part of what um, the Kerwin Commission set out to do when they um, wrote the blueprint for Maryland's future, is that they wanted to change things in such a way that it would, um, that it would be a career choice that more people would look to go into. Um, you know, I know that parts of the blueprint address things like salary, um, planning time, issues that would that that we hear from teachers now about. Um, but you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that everything that what is in the blueprint is are the only things that are keeping people from going into right. education. And it's a bit of chicken and egg, too, Correct. right? Like, they basically are saying, well, you, know, you need to find all of these people now, mm -hmm. you know, before it's actually fixed. <laughs> or, and aren't there some jurisdictions already jumping forward with the salary changes mm -hmm. that we cannot afford right now? I mean, there's other counties that are either providing bonuses or getting to the 60000 Yes, we're all moving toward the sixty thousand right. um, dollar minimum. But what I will say is that, um, you know, at first it looked like it would put us on a more equal playing field with all of the other districts, so that we would be more competitive and be able to get more teachers to come to Carroll County. But um, we know that some of our uh, neighboring districts 
have already declared that they will be offering more mm -hmm. than 60,000 right. in their minimum starting salary, some up to 70, 75,000 yep. starting. So I think what was um, put into blueprint as something that, that would attract people mm -hmm. to education, it, it may help to attract some people, but I don't know that it's gonna help us here in Carroll County as right. much. And I know we have a briefing to get to, but so just one more aspect of this discussion regarding teachers and the conditional uncertified teachers. Uh, does that situation lead to the, um, the, the, the reliance on substitutes the way it does? I and mean, that, that's one of the reasons why we're looking at a budget for substitute teachers that continues to grow because we've got to literally fit people into these holes, if you will, and during yes. the day. Yes, okay. correct. Yeah, we still have, um, you know, we have positions unfilled right now that we hope to um, have filled by the time school starts. But we have certain positions like special education positions, speech pathologists, secondary science and math teachers that have always historically been difficult to fill. Mm -hmm. And in the present situation, it's become more difficult. Do we, do we typically exhaust that? substitute budget if you will and if it's not exhausted it just carries over to the next year is that the generally speaking a very I basic overview of that I'm not sure if my mic's on or not I would say that historically we didn't exhaust the budget since the pandemic we have and so we've supplemented um, you know, the budgets in bigger categories but we supplemented certain categories where savings were realized elsewhere and um, Mr. Diaz our, our HR director sort of describes what we're experiencing as churning um, so when you hire people who are maybe not as well prepared or as prepared uh, to, to be right in the classroom as you might have in the past they need more mentoring they need more support and, and we we're not really um, if you look at our sort of our central support versus other counties we don't have a ton of people just to throw at that and so sometimes you lose those folks or, or they don't make it or you need them out of the classroom in order to be supported and you need substitutes for that and then as we've added positions whether it's blueprint related or just response to pandemic we tend to be hiring our own folks so if we create assistant um, instructional assistant positions for instance we're hiring um, maybe our one-to-one -one special ed assistants to fill those in your, and that's what Ernesto describes as, the, as kind of the churning that we're seeing everywhere in, in the school mm -hmm. system. Um, so, you know, I keep hoping that will stabilize. I think, it, I think it's better uh, this past year by the end of the year than it had been, but it's, it's not where we once were by any measure. On the conditional question, you know, just to be clear, they are certified under, under Maryland law and regulations. And there's a range of reasons why somebody could be conditional. It could be just a complete career changer, or it could be somebody who has taught in the past or held a certificate and they just need six current credits. There, there's a wide range. Uh, and we're still fluidly hiring right now. There's a hundred some names coming to the board mm -hmm. of it tonight. But um, I would say that that percentage is, is not double digit by any means, um, but it's higher than it's been for us. And I will say that once we hire these people, they do have a tendency to stay and because we have a great support system. I mean, our schools are very well run and we have a great benefit package and they really, uh, that health package really helps uh, us in, in Carroll County. It really does. And uh, they find out how well this system is run and that's a plus for us. Even though we might not make as much, mm -hmm. they might make, but, and also they've left and we have, they they've been coming back to yeah. us again. Right. So and that's a big thing. But I, I would say how well the schools are run, and and the behavior of our students, and that benefit package is a biggie. So. I expect you have a breakdown of retention rates at the different levels. Um, that would be something I think very positive to share if it's you know well above other communities, um, because that does mean a lot of people. Sometimes younger folks don't see those benefits as strong, but if they start seeing the percentages of retention, like obviously something's right. Let me dig a little deeper and do Absolutely. due diligence. So, okay. um, Steve, Anybody? do you have anything else to say? No, ma'am. Well, then I think we better let Dr. McCabe say something. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, 
I would just echo what everyone has said. I'm glad that we're uh, continuing to meet and discuss the issues at hand. Um, and, I, you know, in a nutshell, I would just say that, you know, in the past, we've been able to um, work with the Board of Commissioners in the budget process and really get an understanding of, you would get an understanding of what our needs were, what our priorities and initiatives were, and then you could could help us, you know, to budget for that. But this is a completely different animal in that we are being told what we have to do, what initiatives need to be done, and how they're going to be done. And so it isn't like in the past when we could say, okay, we're not going to have the funding to do the, the initiative that we wanted to do, so we won't do it. We'll wait until that funding is more readily available. We don't have that flexibility anymore. And what I don't know the answer to, and no one knows the answer to, is what will happen when we say we can't do this. We don't, you know, we don't have the money to do this. What will happen? Um, will will we be penalized with, um, you know, from the state? I'm not sure, um, but I think that, that that that's where we're at at this point is trying to determine um, what kind of funding we'll be able mm -hmm. to receive and what we'll be able to do with that funding. And whatever funding we don't get, then we've got to make those tough decisions about, okay, you know, in, in order to follow the law, this is what we have to do. That may not benefit every student in our system. And that's, that's I think, where the concern comes for all of us, is we want the best school system for all of our students. Um, and we don't want to have to make decisions that, um, that maybe hurt some students. So. So that's, you know, as we said, what we'll have to work together with you to, um, to determine. So thank you. Thank you for being in this with us. Okay. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Herbert and, and yeah, uh, Commissioner Rothstein, do you mind if I jump in on um, this? I, thanks for some of the comments, Cindy. Um, I, I think one of the things that we really need to understand is, I mean, we need to itemize you know, these are, these are the requirements of the blueprint. This is exactly how much money we expect it to cost. And this is how much money we're going to get from the state, right? And put it in those terms. Because when blueprint was passed, it was basically stated that, you know, the state was supposed to come up with the, the additional money. Like, it said that Carroll County was appropriately funding education mm -hmm. and any additional funds required by the blueprint should be coming from the state. That is clearly not true. And I think we need to point that out. We need to itemize it. We need to show them the numbers and say, okay, it, this, these mandates will require $42 million you know, annually and the state is providing 12, right? And you cannot, ex if, if, if Carroll County was appropriately funding education before, then okay, what, what changed in the last year, right? right? And this is why we can't do the things that we're saying we can't do, right? No, I, I appreciate, you know, from the MAKO discussion, I have it circled and starred, and it is transparency and education spending. So, um, and I think every jurisdiction did the same thing. So that will be, I expect, one of the high topics or priority topics. Let's, um, if it's okay, move on. Uh, Mr. Ted Zaleski, I think, are you uh, <laughs> the lead of discussion and presentation? Sure, I was thinking about leading anything, but I was gonna. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a podcaster, you have a following. <laughs> so followings usually have leaders and you're, you know. No. You can either talk about President Garfield or the budget. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, uh, the superintendent and I talked a month or so ago maybe about how the school capital program is funded and thought maybe this was a good time to talk to both boards, uh, how that works and what it can do, what it can't do uh, as we approach another budget. And it's also timely, I think, because you know, maybe we're in a little bit of a changing place right now. Uh, 
Carroll County Public Schools construction has been pretty boring for a number of years. Uh, we're doing roofs, we're doing HVACs. There haven't been a lot of high profile projects. Uh, Career and Tech and East Middle School are the two exceptions and they're happening right now. But if you look at the last 15 years, um, that's mostly what's happened. Uh, it wasn't always the case. Uh, we used to be much busier figuring out what was gonna get funded and then trying to get things built. Uh, you all are discussing now potential additions to Freedom Elementary School and Sykesville Middle School. Uh, we know there's a long list of other needs. I think you've identified Win William Winchester as your highest modernization priority, but that's far from alone. And kind of what goes along with that is with how our funding works, we are in a position right now where the county can actually take on some projects that 10 years ago, you know, we would have said there isn't any money. Uh, it's not the case now. So there is some money, and I guess that's, that's really what I want to talk about is, you know, how, how does that work and how do we think about where to go from here? So the county, going back to the late 90s, has dedicated a portion of its income tax to the school construction program. Uh, that is not in law. Nobody tells us we have to do it. Uh, board of Commissioners decided to do it and other boards have left it in place. Although I you know, have to say that any board could say we're not doing this anymore. Um, it's totally in their hands. I think there are good reasons for doing it. I think it served both the county and the school system well. I think maybe the big thing that it does for both sides is there's an identified pot of money that is for the purposes of school construction. So a school project is not in competition with a road or a community college or library project. Uh, we, we almost, it's almost like there's two different processes. Uh, now downside potentially from the school's point of view is, okay, but that also limits how much money there is. We're saying there's the pot. Uh, we're not thinking about well, if we need more than that, what are we gonna do? That hasn't been part of the process. Uh, and you could make that argument, but when we weigh the two against each other, again, I, I think even just from the school system's point of view, I think it's, a, it's been a, a good thing. So this is 9.09% of our income tax and might be a Easy question to say, 9.09, .09, that's a really crazy number. Who came up with that? That was Commissioner Rosting. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. no, uh, Commissioner Rosting had probably never even thought about funding a school project when, <laughs> when this number came up. And this actually goes back years. People still call county income tax the piggyback tax sometimes, but there was a time when uh, what happened was you figured out your state taxes and then each county had a percentage that you apply, applied to your state obligation. So you owed $2,000, you know, county had a 50% piggyback, so your county tax was $1,000. Years ago, the uh, county decided they were gonna make, I mean, the state decided they were gonna make changes in the state income tax system that would have carried over to to counties. They, they would have been making decisions for 24 other jurisdictions what their income taxes would look like. And one time where they got it right, they decoupled state income tax from income tax. So we now had, each county now had a percentage that got you the same level of revenue at that point, but was no longer tied to how much state tax you were gonna get. Um, when that decoupling happened, we changed from a 40 or 50 or 60% to a 3% or 2.5%, something like that. Uh, but that, that left the, the school system with this 9.09%, you know, it was just, just the math. So how much money is available is driven very directly by how is income tax doing for us. One good news story for you right now is that income tax has been strong in, in recent years. Uh, we're still struggling to fully understand what that means and what that does for our future.
but uh, we've, we've accumulated a, a, a significant pot of the money there. Now, when you look at how much money is sitting there, and this is just one, one piece, and I almost hate to throw this out isolated from the rest of the story, but I, I think in what we think of as the balance that's available for school projects, there's $37 million approximately. But then when you say, what do we do with our $37 million, and what are the implications for the future, that's where things get complicated very quickly. There's two ways we can use the money that's coming in in income tax. We can use it as cash on a school. We can buy a brick. You paid for it once, and that money is available again next year. Or we can issue debt. If we issue debt, now we've committed ourselves to 20 years worth of, of payments. Uh, so it has very different impacts on how much is available to you in the future for other decisions you want to make. So there can be a lot of incentive to say, okay, there's money, let's use it, let's get some things done. And that's not necessarily wrong, but if we do that, then we need to acknowledge that you've spent that money, now you have to wait years to accumulate money to make the next move. Um, I don't know if I said that right. That was if we use it to issue, issue debt. Now, if we use it as cash, you spend it this year, but that money is still there again next year. So you can spend $10 million of cash, come back next year and spend $10 million of cash. Spend $10 million on, on, on debt, and you have to wait time before uh, you can go there again. So we, we used to be Deb before she abandoned me. Um, we watch very carefully how, how committed are we in this stream of money? How much of it is going to ongoing commitments rather than just one-time uses? And one way you can look at this is if we commit 100% of what we expect to come in every year, uh, then there is no new money other than whatever increase there might be in income tax that we didn't plan for or whatever debt service dropped off. But even, even that, no, that would be built in. So you're really, you're really only looking at how much income tax did you get that you didn't expect. You know, so maybe you know, we got $700,000 more than we, we planned on. There's now $700,000 that you could do something with, but you know, can't get a whole lot accomplished for 700000 Now, on this idea of being 100% committed, you might say, well, that would never happen. Uh, but it, in fact, can happen and has happened. And uh, the most difficult time for us was when we built uh, Manchester Valley High School. We took on a lot of debt with, with that school, and we actually were in a position where we were committed beyond 100% of what we expected to come in every year, which meant we were using all the money that was coming in and we were eating in to the balance that, that existed at that time. So at, th at that point, and this might be overly simple, but there, there, there was no extra money. There was no other money to, to go to. Now, we're no, no longer in that position. But as we make choices on what projects the school system wants to take on, what projects the commissioners are willing to fund, that has to be part of, of the thinking. How much of it is cash that we can use again next year? How much of it is debt service? And that will impact how quickly you can get projects done. And the other thing that comes into the mix here is how much state funding will be available. We can look at what's the county have, what county capacity does that create, but if the state gave a dollar for every dollar we're getting, and I'm not suggesting that that would be the case, I mean, that doubles the capacity. So we have to think about that too. Uh, how much can we take on by what we have in our hands and what we can expect the, the state to do? Um, I have a feeling there were a couple other things I meant to, meant to say, but I'm not thinking of them now. But if, you know, if there are questions, I can. State funding and capacity. Pardon me? Capacity and state funding? Uh, yeah, well, of course, there's always going to be a question on how much is the state going to put in, and, and that's become so much more complicated with this parallel school construction track. Yeah, and I, I guess part of the, 
when we think about what can be accomplished in capacity, there's also 15 years ago when we were doing a lot of projects, or beyond 15 years ago probably, um, we had gotten to a point where we figured 10 or $12 million a year was about what we could expect. It wasn't the same every year, but you know, we had an expectation of that. Um, I think we've had many years where that's about what we're getting now. Some we probably haven't even gotten 10 or $12 million. Uh, as we, if we look to take on more projects, there'll be a, maybe an expectation, certainly a hope that the state is gonna come through with more. If their pot isn't significantly changing, the thing we need to recognize though is the only way we get more is if somebody else gets, gets less. And uh, I doubt any other counties are gonna volunteer to be the <laughs> other one. You know, so what will, that, what will that mean for us? Um, so any, yeah. Um, Ted, I did wanna ask John um, about, yeah, the, so we had developed the, the FCI index um, sort of calculation on the, the school side, um, basically saying, you know, if the average life lifespan of a school before a new modernization is needed is 40 years, right? Like, and there are things that need to be updated on a ma maintenance, things that need to be updated on a regular basis. And we basically calculated an aggregate FCI score for the school system and said, okay, this is the facilities condition index. And if we don't want that to deteriorate, right? Like we, we don't necessarily have to improve it, but we don't want that to deteriorate over time. That would require us, you know, on the schedule of how things how maintenance items would come due, that means that we have to put $40, 40 million dollars of capital projects into the school system every year, right? Um, and you know, I, I'd, I'd like to see how that potentially marries up with current debt service and, and current capacity coming from that 9.09%. Um, you know, like it, I think we updated it, so now it looks like it probably, that number has inflated to probably 46, 47 million dollars a year in order to keep pace. Um, with maintenance needs, um, but has there been any collaboration between the two departments to kind of understand that? And no. <laughs> no, but um, I think that would be a good thing, but almost irrelevant in our current situation because we can't get even remotely close to those kind of numbers. You know, when I said we're sitting on a balance, mm -hmm. the, the balance we're sitting on is $37 million. Uh, we have roughly $20 million a year coming in from income tax. Much of that is already committed, though, to uh, debt service for choices that are already, already made. You know, the idea of us being able to come up with $46 million a year for school construction, uh, I mean, they're just simply, they're, under current circumstances, there is no way to, to accomplish that. Right, and that, that's not all from the county. That, that's 46 million total, like including money that would come from the state, right? But clear, clearly your point is well made though, that even if that's half, even if it's only half of the 46 million, we don't have that kind of funding available. But I think that those are numbers that we need to see on the page to understand the exact situation that we're in and what implications that has for the condition of the, the school system over time. Yeah. yeah, and a good point. So the way I said that what was wrong. And if you think in real simple terms, you know, if you need $46 million a year and half of that is coming from the state, now of course I would question if we can really expect $23 million a year from this, the state. I don't, I don't believe we can. Uh, but if we could, and the county's left with $23 million and we have $20 million a year coming in, then you are in, in the ballpark. If there weren't already other commitments, that service we need to pay for, you know, if, if you could use all that as cash every year, you, you could almost, almost get there. If I could bring up one more point, there's a couple of more issues that I think will significantly affect our capital issues going forward. And um, one is growing, growing enrollment in the county. We're on a trajectory now of growing to heights we've never seen before in our county within the next, what, decade or so. Coupled with the blueprint mandate that requires full day pre-K for three and four year olds. And um, thankfully they've already got a waiver in place for the pre-K issue because we can't find enough partners in the community to meet the 50-50 requirement. 
And if we are required to increase brick and mortar of our schools to accommodate full day pre-K for three and four year olds, I just don't know where we're gonna find the capital funds to expand our schools to accommodate the three and four year old full day pre-K requirement. So again, that's just something else to keep in your mind as we go forward. Oh yeah, definitely a concern of mine. And back from the full day kindergarten mandate, we still have four schools that haven't had expansions there. So those are still hanging out there. Clearly we don't have the space to house all the pre-K students that we're, we're talking about. And you know, another difficult, it's difficulty for you, but it's also a difficulty for us trying to figure out these, these things. You know, the, the blueprint idea that half of this was gonna be, half of pre-K was gonna be provided by the private sector, which I don't think anybody believes, but it's still the law. Uh, how do we plan for what we need to do for pre-K space when we don't even know how many pre-K students we're responsible for? The expectations on enrollment. Um, you know, last meeting <clears throat> I attended with you went through the master plan and the numbers. There were some definite challenges in specific schools and specific grades, I think. But overall, was it, it wasn't like a blanket increase in enrollment, was it? I'm, I'm trying to recall last year, the numbers. Last year, our enrollment increased about 700 students. Right. Um, and we foresee it increasing each year. Um, John, do you have uh, figures you, for that? And actually, they're in your packet. We, we put in your packet um, the, the presentation just for reference that Commissioner Rothstein just mentioned from a work session in late May. It's the one that says Educational Facilities Master Plan. Right. And regrettably, I printed the copy where the slide numbers are sort of tucked into the CCPS logo, but it's slide five, which gives you that five-year window. So. Um, you know, we do 10-year projections by, by uh, state requirement. Um, Mr. Kane, our facilities planner, is, is very accurate even across a 10-year window, but five, the five-year mark has always been the year or, or the benchmark where we've looked at sort of like a, a good planning year and where Bill is actually very, very accurate. And so that, that's, that fifth slide would show you what superintendent just said. We were up 745 students this year. We don't expect to continue to to grow at that rate over five or 10 years. But our projections at each of the three levels uh, in this most recent round of projections, which, which the president of your board saw at that meeting, are significantly higher than they were pre-pandemic or the last time we had a pretty accurate look five years out. And so to Mr. Whistler's point, if you see the projections, they may well be in here for the full 10 years, but if you see the projection over a 10 year window, it would have us growing back to a place where we're very close to our highest enrollment point ever. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think somebody might have just asked the question, where is it? Or maybe Mr. Mr. Rustin alluded to it. So where we were already seeing pressure in certain schools, and particularly in the southern area, that you see that amplified. Um, and that has something to say about the work of the Southern Area Redistricting Committee and some additions that, that Mr. Zaleski just referred to. But in general, that's, you know, that growth is sort of seen across the school system. And so you see, um, if you flip from, the, from there to the next couple of slides, you'll see a lot of southern area schools, but you also begin to see some schools in different parts of the county, particularly Westminster area, starting to show up as, um, as being defined as approaching inadequate or inadequate under the Board of Ed's policy on um, utilization of a school building. And so, I guess for us the broad theme was we're growing again after a period of time where we were either retracting or, or had sort of flattened. And then from a, from a what to do right now standpoint, a, a big part of that work session on the 31st was what do we do with the southern area where we had invested a lot of time in, in redistricting and now the numbers have sort of shifted, um, you know, significantly, at least in my mind, from what the committee looked at and we have the blueprint. You know, we have we have this other thing that we weren't anticipating or thinking about from a capital lens then. So, so where do we go forward? And so the board of ed made the, made the decision, if not that night at their June meeting, to go ahead and include in its in the board's uh, educational facilities master plan um, the larger addition of the two options presented for Sykesville and the smaller addition for for Freedom. And, but just so that everyone's clear, that was one part of figuring out the, 
the issue of capacity and utilization in the southern part of the county or, or increasingly more of the county, not the complete complete solution there. Um, and then so the direction beyond that was let's then spend the next year looking for other solutions and alternatives and, and what they might be and, and report back periodically to the to the board. And so you, you know, um, no disagreements with anything that, that Ted has said, but the the way the capital picture has always worked from sort of this side of the parking lot is we, we do the facilities master plan because we're required to, but also because that's sort of like our needs analysis. Um, and I think sometimes citizens might get a little, they, maybe it bothers folks if we request something and then you don't fund it. But that's, that's it's, it's no different than the operating budget, really, when you think about it. That's how it works. So the facilities plan is the needs analysis. The CIP, which the Board of Ed votes on in October, is the budget request. And then you, you consider that just like you do the operating budget request. And I think there's always been an understanding that you, you're not going to be able to fund everything that, you know, most years has been requested. Just to shake Ted up a bit at that same meeting <laughs> and in the uh, master plan, Willie, William Winchester is no longer the priority, Liberty High School is. Oh, so okay. that changes your bottom that. line. Yes. That changes how to view your bottom line. Um, and we would understand that going forward. But either um, way, they're both concerns. They are concerns. Okay. And then for the blueprint, there's more than just pre-K. We've talked most about that because it's sort of the cleanest to try to understand. In last year's master plan, there, there was the beginning of the process to try to address full day pre-K. Our share under the law, not what happens if the private sector doesn't show up. That's still outside the realm of where the board's planning documents would be. Um, and then there's more, and we actually have reference to it in the slideshow for later, there's more parts of the blueprint that have a capital impact as well, but not as large as the, the, the full day pre-K part does. And um, Liberty is because you adjusted the timeline, correct? Associated with? Um, yeah, so the analysis that we use to get to what uh, uh, board members have been referred to as an FCR, Facility yep. Condition Index, the initial assessment uh, reviewed all of the schools constructed up to 1980. Right. And this past year, we added some a, a chunk of schools since 1980. Liberty had never been assessed and was now assessed as a right. result of that process. And that's why it suddenly appears, maybe to some out of nowhere, to us, we've always known when we assess that school, it's, it's, it's right. going to be a priority. Um, but we do a, an age and condition index and a, a f what we call a functional index, or how well mm -hmm. does the building serve the educational programs in mm -hmm. Liberty School. I think scored last in both of those areas, but yeah. it's certainly in the composite score, scores last, which makes it, last means it becomes the top priority. So it's, it, it jumped ahead of, or it, it maybe didn't jump ahead of, once assessed, it became the top priority. Yep. And, and for whatever reason, um, we don't need to go back in time. Liberty was built more cheaply than most of the Carroll County schools, and anybody that that deals with schools know it's had maintenance issues. Um, the only reason it wasn't the highest priority is because it wasn't counted. Correct. And, and I think everybody, and you've talked to the maintenance guys, I mean, my gosh, I'm surprised they can drink out of the fountain and go to the bathroom. It's my understanding. I know Commissioner Kyler likes to say, I've been here forever, and that is not true. <laughs> and that, and that, pre, that predates me, Mr. Kyler. But it, it's, it's sort of loosely my understanding has always been that Liberty was a school that the county as a whole in that moment chose to build to the exact level of state funding. Right. And as a result, you get kind of a, a weirdly weird architecture where you have sort of levels and tiers and pie-shaped classrooms and all of those sorts of things that adds to the functional score part of it the school's uh, classrooms are smaller than what we see at the other high schools and as mr. O'Neill just indicated the just the shape of the classrooms um, is odd and it and it doesn't lend itself to higher class sizes, which is what we're most likely going to see with implementing Blueprint, especially in the southern region. Right. No, so this I, is a, I'm, I'm sorry, Ted. So I, I know that in the past there was some discussion about whether or not the, in, or the increase in enrollment was somehow predicated on uh, pandemic revamp, but you guys are pretty confident at this point that this is no longer just a matter of populations of school levels returning to normal. 
this is actual enrollment growth sustained through the next so many I believe we have rebounded from the pandemic and you know just to be clear for anybody who might email I don't literally mean that every kid who left during the pandemic has one by one come back but sort of the numbers have readjusted back the sustained growth beyond that seems to be consistent post pandemic you know averaging I don't know if Ray or Bill are here maybe on average across a 10 year window two to 300 kids a year gotcha so you get over the 745 uptick this past year and then you're looking at that kind of sustained growth which is more than we've seen since you know since before the great recession not the highest we've ever seen in time but mm -hmm. consistently more than where we've been in a long long time and that would I think well, that was the early 2000s I think and there were a couple mm -hmm. of schools built around that time if I'm remembering correctly yeah. There were a lot of schools built around yeah. that time. Yeah. <laughs> and then the financial crisis hit and things changed very yeah. dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> and you do have a lot of people moving into the county. I mean, the, I know, I mean, I see reports as far as how long a house sits on the market. I mean, in Carroll County, they are not that long. They, they go up for sale and within, within a month, they're, they're basically sold. So it's, it's a lot of people moving in to the area. And you know, it's interesting that you bring that up too, because I know like one of the, the jokes that I sometimes hear is Carroll County is where people go to retire, but that's obviously not the case. You have younger families that are moving yes. in. And I guess that helps to account for the enrollment growth that we're going to be experiencing. Yep, I mean, I can even you know, testify to that. When, you know, my family and I, we moved from where we were living to another home outside of Westminster and the individuals that bought our former house they're getting ready to start a family, and they they moved here from Cecil County. So we are having families coming in that are starting mm -hmm. out, you know, buying the that the time during the '80s was the split foyers and the ranchers. You do have new families coming in and buying those homes to start a family. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to proudly say the people are moving into Carroll County because they like the way we do things right. here. It's we're a, do, we're it's doing a, something right. We're doing something right. <laughs> I, I, and I think that's a big part of it. But the other part, and I don't know um, how you calculate all that in. I know a lot of Carroll County people that were born here are married, and they're having kids 10 years later than the last generations did. They're starting to have kids at age 30, and so that's a whole different number coming on. Yeah, I would I say it has to be net positive, not my, now, so well, let me say this. You should have a more intelligent person. You should have Mr. Kane or your own demographers. Uh, I'm, I'm none of those things, but birth rates are factored in, and then we use something called a cohort survival method. So if more kids than expected show up in second grade next year, in that one year that's unexpected but then that's carrying forward so to see sustained um, unexpected growth and historically that there's analyses from the county staff back then that, that that's been true that unexpected is generally positive net migration so even if permits aren't being issued at a historic level that would indicate to me loosely that has houses turn over more than in the past decade or so 15 years people with kids are moving into those houses yeah and this is a conversation we have with the realtors there's no inventory or very little inventory they are selling homes much faster than a month I mean mm -hmm. especially down south it's you know a week you know I mean it's still a very hot market but there's just no inventory um, you know but there is growth that's still happening and that's definitely a concern for everything we're talking but um, I think this leads us into the discussions that you all had and recommendations on moving forward with um, both the elementary school and the middle school down in the south um, with Freedom Elementary and Sykesville Middle. If you can uh, walk us through, you know, not necessarily the entire package, you know, kind of get to the recommendation, you know, because I'm personally one who doesn't judge or counter the expert on their recommendation. You know what right looks like. I think we need to understand what you believe right looks like along with the price tag and then ensure that the community understands that that's what we're looking at. So, so these uh, recommendations came out of the SARC with the Southern Area Redistricting Committee. 
um, a committee that got together that included uh, parents and staff um, uh, to look at um, look at overcrowding in the southern area and what would be the best remedy for that. John, do you want to walk us through some of the uh, findings? Sure. So in, in your packet, just so you have it for future reference or today, you do have the two full feasibility studies. So when the SARC presented its report, I think it was September of 22, um, they presented an array of possible options. Some of those options included the concept of, uh, of, of marrying additions to buildings along with some redistricting amounts. And, um, and also, even at that time, we were all sort of wondering what the blueprint might mean from a capital or staffing or a school size lens and so the board made the board of ed made the decision to commission these two feasibility studies so you have them in full um, in essence when you hire the architects and engineers that they're hired to tell you whether or not you can put an addition on a building and if so roughly what would it mean and roughly how much would would the budget estimate be and each study came up with two options a smaller option and a, and a larger option for each school um, and after much discussion and, and deliberation at that work session and beyond, the Board of Ed chose to move forward in its educational facility plan, so the sort of the needs analysis. The larger addition, which I believe is 10 classrooms and then the other space for Sykesville and a smaller classroom or a smaller addition for Freedom, which is a five classroom and other space uh, addition. And, and that had largely to do with um, sort of the, the, the site and what it comfortably would 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 permit it freedom that's not you know the greatest footprint of land to, to, to further build on and at the same time in the master plan directs staff to continue to look at the rest of the picture okay let's continue to understand what we need to do with the blueprint and, and from a capital lens um, let's see if there's another school that warrants an addition or not as part of this but also what what if you do include the redistrict or the um, additions and it's funded from a capital side what would a redistricting plan ultimately look like based on that but our numbers were growing and when i said you know the south had southern area had been the issue more than the southern area was becoming a concern by the time the sark finished and with these newest projections if you wanted to reform the committee this is one of the things we said to the board it's no longer the sark it's something more than that if you want to reform the committee the committee almost needs to take not a not really a, a from scratch look, but you know a, di a different look. Um, but but the board made the decision to move these two um, addition options into its master plan, which means it could come to you as part of the CIP as one part of looking at this overall puzzle. I, I hope, Commissioner, that's what you wanted and not. Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, understanding, and I, you should have the slide. Somebody has control those slides I'm not sure who these here. are not those slides though sorry but you have the master plan I don't have that I didn't give that to Chris okay. to this is a okay, that's slide. Okay. but it's it yeah if you so if you want the overview they are in here um, and you can you can get to them pretty quickly because you can see that right the, the, the so so it comes down at Freedom Elementary and cr definitely correct me if I'm wrong five classroom addition yes sir um, which includes one pre-k classroom 9,035 square feet addition, including one workroom, one resource room, the girls and boys restrooms, staff restrooms, mechanical and custodial closets, state rate capacity 637, which includes 20 pre-K, and then the estimated construction cost of Five million two hundred eighty-eight thousand. Yes, sir. That is the option the board moved forward. That's slide eighteen. If you kind of hone in on the on the on the uh, under the logo, and then for the Sykesville option that the board moved forward, it would be slide um, twenty-nine, and that's um, a ten-classroom addition, eight general classrooms, two science labs with prep, two workrooms, four research source rooms, uh, restrooms, st uh, staff and student restrooms, mechanical and custodial closets, um, art and, and health are the special areas and storage for them included 22,310 square feet um, and uh, an ultimate uh, estimate, budget estimate, construction estimate of 12.7 million. And yeah, we'll ensure, I mean, the, these slides are available, I know, to the community because I've seen them highlighted in some 
people posting social media and stuff. Sure. But, um, I imagine they're on your site, and we'll make sure that they're also available on ours. Um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music, you know, across the table, understanding these two slides, which are pretty critical as far as capital projects, but also the community. This is what we're looking at in the southern part of the, the county. Freedom Elementary with a handful of classrooms, Sykesville Middle with 10 classroom additions. Okay. And, and we can make the full feasibility studies available. Yeah. I think they may be, but I'll double check. We can make them available online okay. as well. And I said this at the work session, and I just remembered I said this. And we all took a tour at one time of the sites, and Mr. Yep. Kyler was on the Board of Ed, and Mr. Kyler pointed out at Freedom that he believed that if there could be an addition, it would be built in one location, and that's where it turned out to be. So there, there you go. Yeah, yeah don't look. But <laughs> I, I have a question, and now you're not going to like me anymore. Um, <laughs> the five million seems too cheap. Are these based on state square foot numbers? Is there do we lose anything because it's smaller, um, or because of the how complicated that site is? And did we think about stormwater management? And and it. Sykesville doesn't seem so bad. This one just seems too cheap. I'm going to call upon Mr. Prokop, our Director of Facilities, and I, I actually would like to agree. Earlier, Ted said our capital project had been boring, but Ray is anything but boring. Yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, and, and I thought of this question just to get him to the mic. <laughs> when they're boring, they're going well. We want them boring. That's right. Uh, in terms of the, the development of the, the, the budget estimates, the, the consultant go, goes through all that. And in this case, we went as far as to get uh, almost a schematic design. Uh, so we would include uh, stormwater management and, and, and whatnot. So, you know, we feel pretty comfortable that that's, these, are, these are accurate. Um, so, so we went a little bit further this time than we would typically do for some, this sort of a feasibility study. So we're, we're pretty comfortable. Good. Then, then that's a good issue. So three walk away um, thoughts on capital projects, Freedom, Sykesville, and Liberty are really the three things that we've talked about. Liberty because of the timeline change as far as now being included since we're looking at 1980 forward, right? And then um, Freedom and Sykesville. Okay. Plus, again, we don't want to lose sight of William Winchester mm -hmm. because it's going to be right there. Yep. Yeah. Be the next big one. Okay. John, these cost estimates, though, these are these are full cost estimates, right? This doesn't take into account any state participation that we might be able to get. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. And do we think, for any reason, that I mean, so our our state rate of capacity numbers and enrollment numbers are such that we'd get full state participation or would it be a reduced state participation? Yeah. I, I don't know about full, maybe more likely for freedom, but I, we do expect there would be some participation. And then another thing to note, um, I thought about when Ted was speaking, that one, one statutory change in the last couple of years that's good from the state is that they now participate in, in um, design, which they historically did not do so a little more as well because a little more than historically as well because of that um, to the extent they participate and then also um, Mount Airy Elementary School is also um, not as close you know as far as uh, challenges like Liberty but it's still you know something to be aware of yeah. okay um, yeah. Um, okay. Are there any thoughts of good? Because I, I want to just I want to keep this moving. You know, kind of looking at the capital project, understanding. Um, I won't say dollars available. <laughs> that is, I think, the wrong way of thinking it. But dollars that are there, that Ted described, and where they're coming from. Are there any additional thoughts from any of us? Questions, thoughts, comments. Now, among the different options that are presented in here, are there certain options in here that you guys feel most comfortable with or that you would prefer to see based on what's in here? 
Oh, the, the, so well, I mean, just as an yeah. example, I'm sorry. So like, for example, some of them have like a four classroom edition, a yeah. five classroom option, a yes, nine sir. classroom option. So that, that work session was on May 31st at the June board meeting, whatever the second Wednesday was. The board then approved the master, the facilities master plan and they moved forward the 10 classroom edition for Sykesville or, or what's uh, detailed on slide 29 and the five classroom edition for Freedom, which was slide 18, I think, Commissioner. And and what's the critical time frame for this? Obviously, you want it as soon as possible. Is there like a, if the decision was made by September, that gives you a better chance of state money or, you know, who knows what inflation is going to happen. We, you guys were very aggressive and got East Middle and Career and Tech started ahead of the bubble. Um, is there anything we need to think about for this? Uh, uh, we, and, and, and I'm only one one person and uh, get put in my place often I, I think we ought to try to get this rolling so we wouldn't anticipate it wouldn't even come to you as a funding request until October for you to consider in this funding cycle if, if you if you moved it forward with design money then we would work on that for would you say one year of design and two of construction or one of each right yeah, I mean, So, so he's not Mike, but he said three years if you approve funding yeah, yeah. in this cycle. And, and in some ways, that that wasn't a, in light of wanting to better, uh, wanting to more fully understand what the blueprint might mean for us in terms of staffing and class size and capital and looking and having time to explore what else beyond these additions is required to sort of solve the puzzle. That's, that's not too too concerning to us as staff and also so, Ray doesn't have a, you know one thing I hate to do this one thing we cut during the years of cuts were project managers in his construction office so we don't have sort of unlimited human human capital to to build too many you know too many but, things at one but time. if both of these at the same time would start in October and be completed in three years Mike or not, we're holding you to that. Yes. Hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but Commissioner Kyler's. What, what okay. concerns do you have of Blueprint or Liberty or anything else? That are we, are we tying your hands on another project by letting this happen? My concerns are just what, for that part of the county, what what does the Blueprint compliance with the fiscal requirements mean for class size? Uh, teacher and other staffing ratios, th those sorts mm -hmm. of things. But I, I would add to that, I don't think we're ever going to build a school or renovate a school so that there can be class sizes of 45. Yes. Because exactly. that's... Regardless. Regardless. Because, I'd hate to see you do that. You know, well, <laughs> we would not make that decision. We have to fight Blueprint, man. Absolutely. So, um, Ted, I don't want our selves to get too far in front of our skis or hit over the skis. Um, but I do want us to move forward, you know. Uh, we've got, I want to say, well, yeah, we've got to be aggressive to getting what it looks like, what right looks like, and taking care of the kids, that, especially when their classes are becoming overcrowded and there's a lot of frustration. Um, I mean, no matter what we say, if the numbers are only this, it feels like a mountain, even if it's a little hill. But to us, it's a mountain to a whole lot of people and a whole lot of kids. And um, so, Ted, I mean, are we being too aggressive in our thoughts? What are your... And when did you bring this up? Four years this? ago? This? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the Sark, yeah. I, yeah. It was like the first few meetings I had, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. So I four years ago, this. this conversation started. So right now we're not being aggressive or passive because we're, we haven't really taken this up. Right. And to Commissioner Kyler's question, I think one of the difficulties we face is the horrible mismatch between the state timeline and, yeah. and our timeline, which is dictated to us. We, we, we have no choice in that. So when, when you say, how do we get these two projects rolling, uh, as, as John said, they haven't even requested them of us yet and, and won't be for months. And we're even further until the commissioners take up their next budget process. 
So really, if, if you want to actively change how they're thinking about moving ahead, I think that would take the commissioners ahead of any budget discussions saying, we're not there, but we're promising when we get there, these projects are part of what we're going to adopt. Which is part of that 9.09% .09 income tax dollar debt, whatever dollar amount you were saying. Well, right now, $37 million. That, that is not a problem for you. If you wanted to commit to these projects, fiscally, we, we can do it. You know, the question would be, are, are you willing to commit yourself before you've taken on a budget process to doing and, it? And, and yeah. you've caused me to change my question. How quickly can this happen and we maximize the money we get from the state? I don't think it could speed up with all due respect to Ted because we still have to follow the state process and they, they'll want to see your financial commitment through your budget process. So it, it, it'll be next, when you adopt your 25 plan would be when we could move forward with this. And that doesn't change to three years. No, no. Right, and I, I agree with you. My point was just that no. you would be able to work differently if you know the commissioners are on board. You would be thinking about it differently. I mean, if this is common sense, if this is where we're expecting to go and you know doubt is being removed on all levels you know I always say hope is not a course of action you got to kind of look at the resources time people and money and we know we can allocate the money to doing this why look at the time and wait you know if it's the right thing to do I mean I, I don't understand what would we okay. be waiting for okay well they they have to follow the state process, and part of the state process is going to be them seeing that you've committed. And you sitting here today and saying, yeah, we're on board, isn't going to get them there. They're right. going to want to see it's been adopted in a, in a budget. Mm -hmm. And when you say, you know, it's just common sense, why wouldn't we move, it, move ahead? I just want to caution that even among everything that they could think about, I'm sure you could find internal thoughts that maybe that's not the highest priority right. and certainly we've not had any discussions right. about that, right. that yet no I, and I, I i appreciate that and i'm not again trying to jump too fast and saying oh i recommend this is it. but i'm i'm trying to understand all the timelines associated with making these decisions and what effects will occur when these decisions are made if they're made, you know, soon, late commitments from the state, you know, um, getting the delegation, if they're necessary to get them on board, you know, going down to Mako, having the conversations with Mabe. I, I mean, I have, I don't know. That's, so, that, so, that's what I'm trying to kind of Yes, yeah, yeah, so Ted, if, if, if and, and you know me, I oversimplify and probably don't understand. So it's, it's July and you're saying this, could be in black and white in October. No, for us it won't be black and white until the end of May. Right. When you adopt your yeah, next yeah, budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it could be in a budget by uh, what, how what? No. Uh, what, how soon do we need to do something? Do no. we need to have another meeting more Other specifically, th or, or what do we need to do? If you wanted to do something that made money money available before next July. We would have to open up the budget that you just adopted okay. and amend that. But, but you don't need that. And, and honestly, probably don't want that because if we don't follow the state process, then we're not, exactly. not going to ensure that we maximize their participation. You just want a commitment. You know, John, it might be useful for the commissioners if you kind of hit some of the state process milestones. I think including you know, going all the way to the end of the General Assembly where the last decisions on funding are made. Yes, you mean in terms of their funding timeline? Right. So when we submit a CIP to you in October, it also goes to the state, and it, it goes to the um, something called the I, a, um, IAC, or the Interagency Commission on School Construction, which now, is, as of this year, is an independent body that used to be attached to the State Department of Ed. They review all of the requests, and they set a preliminary funding level estimate of like 75% statewide and then and then what your portion would be as a county and um and then as the general assembly deliberates through the state budget capital budget process ultimately you find out what your final 
full funding number would be for all of your projects in the CIP. But along the way, there's um, forms and documents and feasibility studies and uh, analyses that spreadsheets that uh, Ray and Bill have to complete to submit to them to say, so even if you fund a project fully, they have to approve it, um, believe it or not. And, and, and part of that process in that timeline is figuring out exactly what will be the maximum state participation, which all of us are going to want at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And as and while I understand everything you're saying, to, you know, to try to jumpstart that process, I think puts that, I'm not sure what that would mean for state participation. So you guys need to put it in black and white in your October, October CIP. CIP. Yes, so I guess the question is, what do you need from us to be comfortable to do that? Nothing. I think the Board of Ed it made, you know, this is a planning document and a needs assessment, but I think they've sort of begun to make that decision when they made, when yes. they made this their See, master plan. Their process has always moved ahead of our process. Yes. And I think as John is trying to say, there's, there's no way to really change, change that. We, we could say whatever we want, approve whatever we want, and they're still subject to the whole state process. And even, you know, John said, even if we said we're just going to pay for it, which we did with Manchester Valley, still had to go through the state process exactly like any other yeah. school. Yes, I, I just uh, don't want to see us be in a position where you comfortably move forward, you get state money, you get whatever, and then we say, ah, now we change our mind. The place where we would be a problem is if they get state approval and then we don't approve. Exactly. Right. Okay. And we can't really promise that, but we can say that's our intention. But it's hard. How do you promise that? Sign it in blood. You say it on record here. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. I was asking this side. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not I knew you guys had an answer. <laughs> and just to be clear, you know, I, well, I see that said you guys could promise it. I, I am not oh, I encouraging know. you to do that. <laughs> when when you said early on in the meeting that we could promise it, you threw my whole day off. I thought, oh my gosh, what, what's wrong? <laughs> and what's really good, too, about these is the administrators gave their input regarding the additions as well. Um, you know, they were in, at the meeting that we had, you know, the work session regarding this and you know, both the administrators, administrations, like they, this is what they're comfortable with and what they think would be good. So, we beat this one well and had a very good discussion on it. Next couple of things is the uh, your priorities, um, working through the state, and then also operating budget. And I think um, you start your closed at three. Is that correct? Yes. So in the next 20 minutes, and it's on you. Yeah, that yes. will be great. We'll just kind of. Um, we'll kind and I apologize for keeping this long. Oh, that's okay. I mean, as far as our legislative priorities, um, I, we've already talked a bit about that. We basically are going to be looking to um, collaborate with you and our delegation to look at extended timelines or exceptions for certain pieces of blueprint, uh, things like that would, would help us as a school system um, to move forward a little bit more slowly. Um, but um, I would like to turn your attention to the pressures on the operating budget. And you have um, one sheet in your folder uh, that looks like this. Um, and then you have a packet that says Board of Education operating budget pressures. Um, the, the legislative priorities, just please, um, if you can, uh, sure we have them prior to us attending MECO. Oh, yes. Uh, which is middle of August. This we'll way write, we'll I write can. write something up for it. I can physically have yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think, yeah, the more we have for MECO, the better. Yeah. And I think we need to look strongly at September. I know what, what we saw in Annapolis, the people that got something to delegation people in November, December, they never caught up to because right. in January they hit the ground running exactly. and, and it's too late to say, well, can I see more information? Can I do whatever? So the earlier we can do that, the, the better position we are. 
And Cindy, what is our process for, I mean, so the, you have a timeline of three weeks that you need that information before MAKO. What is our process for kind of firming up what our legislative priorities are? We, uh, we pretty much have them. Um, we just need to sit down and write them up in language that we, that we know will, um, will be, that they'll be able to hand to somebody and they'll be able to, you know, take to the floor, read, understand. Okay. Um, well, and, and August is still only a working group. It's a second working group, but it's a second of like three or four as we shape our legislative priorities going into right. Annapolis. The earlier the better. Earlier yes. the better. Right. But the, the legislative priorities will be in at least enough detail that we'll be saying things like, we need a waiver on the 75% yes. compensatory yes. education requirement. We exactly. need a waiver on the 60-40 planning yep. time. We yep. need a waiver. Okay. Yes. All right. Yep. Um, so the, the first sheet that, <coughs> that I pointed out, this is, this is something that um, is basically a glide path, or it's really not, it doesn't glide very well. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the numbers, so I hate to call it a glide path, but um, it basically shows um, what we're looking at as far as um, operating budget costs due to blueprint requirements um, for fiscal 25 through 27. John, do you want to take them through them a little bit? Sure. So, so you have the, the sheet that Dr. McCabe referred to where you could see three years at one time side by side, and we wanted to sort of use this presentation to help hopefully help present it a little bit too. And I, I promise I'll be as quick as possible. So when you ask the question on the agenda, what, what are the pressures on our operating budget? I think the first three bullets here are always, ha, have always been the pressures on our operating budget. How much is inflation gonna cost us? What can we do and, and, and can we accomplish an employee compensation? And for us, that requires uh, mandatory collective bargaining with five, uh, five unions. And what are the mandates, funded or unfunded, coming from Annapolis, coming from the state, coming from wherever that, that we have to face in every year? Or mandates historically might have included sort of board priorities. What, what are the things we'd like to do if we could, and, and, and can we secure the funding to do that? And then the blueprint's certainly a mandate, but it's, it's kind of its own thing as a mandate. It's, it's a mandate in a lot of different ways. There are new initiatives, and we've talked about some of those over time, mandatory full-day pre-K. A lot of things with college and career ready, particularly with uh, uh, workforce development and the community college and advanced placement and the career and tech center or career and tech programs. Um, we've referred to the, the teacher time requirements, generally the 60-40 time split, the career ladder as a whole, $60,000 as a starting salary in two, year, two years. Those are all things I would call sort of like new requirements or new initiative. Then there's the fiscal compliance um, reallocations. That's what the superintendents invested so much time with the community at the, at the town halls and otherwise sort of talking about how I've come to think of the blueprint as sort of a retro active law. You know, usually a law gets passed and it has an October 1 date and on October 1 you begin to do what the law says you do. And in this case, you know, the blueprint became a law and we, and on a certain date. But really what it requires us to do, all of us at school systems, is to take a look at our existing, always operating school system and reshape it based on the buckets of funding. And that's what the superintendent spent so much time on, particularly the compensatory education piece. Um, but I'll talk about an example or two more as well in a, in a second. Then there's sort of these indirect pressures. They're not written into the blueprint law, but they're coming regardless. Wage compression. You can't raise your teacher salary scale and not raise your administrator <laughs> salary scale and send some others along the way. Uh, many of the staffing needs that we spent some time on earlier. And then capital pressures as well, not really in the operating budget, but uh, you know, pre-K, we kind of under, I think we all generally kind of understand there's a lot of career and technical education requirements in the blueprint we haven't yet talked a lot about that will require space somewhere. And I'm not necessarily saying you're gonna to have to build another career and tech center, but it's gonna require space somewhere. Um, teacher time, where, where does everyone work if suddenly you have to hire 120, 125 more teachers to, to meet the teacher time requirement? So there's, there's those different, um, different parts of this. And then the next couple of slides break this chart into thirds. So, so this is fiscal uh, 25, and there's a lot of assumptions built in here. We tried to note them on the handout and, and also at the bottom of each of these slides. Um, 
But just generally, you know, inflation is always there. You have it, we have it, everyone's household has it. And so on our budget, we'd estimate somewhere around $5 million in, um, in fiscal 25 for things like pension, insurances, those uh, fuel uh, utilities, those kinds of costs. Um, in, the, in the realm of employee compensation, we have to implement a career ladder through collective bargaining by next year. And that also comes with a cost. And so this creates a, a tiered structure of, of teachers and administrators in multiple roles, um, sort of teacher leadership tracks and administrator leadership tracks uh, from the beginning of your career on up. And um, you know the board and, and the superintendent asked for a long time to, to try to come up with an estimate for that. I went back to the Career Commission, or Kerwin Commission report um, there's a lot on the career ladder in there. Obviously, there's sort of a graphic where, how, however, they came up with it. So again, a lot of assumptions here, but however they came up with it, the Kerwin Commission estimated percentages of your teaching workforce and where they would ultimately be placed on the career ladder. And then the blueprint legislates salary add-ons for those placements on the career ladder. So I took the size of our workforce, those percentages, and the mandated um, add-ons, which again, subject to collective bargaining, which is what does the law say the add-on should be, and came up with sort of a $4.5 million cost to adjust our workforce onto the career ladder as the Kerwin Commission envisioned it. And then there's the $60,000 starting teacher salary. We know that uh, we need to be there in two, in two years by law um, with the ratified agreement being um, put into effect this July 1 with, with your funding support. That leaves us a little over 15% from having our starting teacher salary be $60,000. And so the 13 million you're seeing here, the assumption is, um, this is sort of like if, if the blueprint could go off as seamlessly as possible, this takes the entire scale and moves it by that percentage and this is half of that cost. So if in two years the scale has to move 15.4%, this is year one of making that happen. Um, the, the line item for administrators is to try to try to keep that integrity of our overall structure so that a teacher can still want to become a, an assistant principal and then a principal over time and not make so much that you would you would never that no one would ever leave the classroom and then we have three other unions that aren't really at all part of the blueprint um, that we still have to be mindful of and, and work with through collective bargaining and we were very successful this past year in securing some agreements with them. College and career ready, there's way more than just this, uh, but just trying to hit the biggest costs. We have the um, $1.6 million that were in the FY24 budget for the partnership, the MOU with uh, uh, um, Heather Powell and her team at, at Workforce Development. That also increases every year based on inflation and based on the change in the number of students. So that $20,000 is sort of building from that 1.6 million in 24. Dual enrollment, we're sort of, you know, at the mercy of the college's uh, tuition costs and fees, which you know, I'm not even sure the process that they use to change them, but this number has more to do with anticipating participation of our students. So I'm not trying to assume anything in terms of tuition or cost, just we're seeing the number of students go up um, as, as these opportunities become more aware. And for advanced placement, we have to cover the full costs of that for the students who choose that college and career uh, pathway, and that, that has to do a lot with the cost of the test and or the training necessary or the, the cost necessary to have our, our staff be able to administer the test. Pre-K expansion will continue um, pending capital funding and other things for, uh, forever under the, for, for the 10 year window of the blueprint. So these are costs just to keep adding full day classrooms to comply with the 50% that we know under the blueprint, uh, blueprint the slots for kids, the 50% that we know we're required to, um, to apply. So this isn't the capital cost and this isn't what if there aren't enough private providers and the state ultimately says you're responsible for 100%. This is just progressing towards what we know the blueprint says for us. Uh, teacher time, we had requested in this year's, well, we had hoped in this year's budget to begin the process of phasing in the, and, and Mr. Whistler's right, our estimate is somewhere around 120, 125 teachers to get to the place where the workforce could balance to the time requirement. We weren't able to fund the first 15, so in 25 we'll be, we'll be trying to budget for 30. Uh, because we were trying to budget 15 additional FTE per year over eight years to meet the full phase in requirement there. So uh, because we didn't, do, we weren't able to do the 15 this year 
uh, you see 30 and 25, you'll see 15 and 26 and 27. Um, when during the pandemic with the, with the situations we were seeing with changes in population and that sort of thing, uh, so the Board of Ed used a very small portion of its ESSER funding for some class size reduction positions. Those are being funded again with ESSER this year. That money will go away after, after fiscal 24, when I say this year. And so the whole, the whole analysis is pred predicated upon those people still being with us. So the, the 15 per year to get to uh, teacher time assumes that these positions that have been funded with federal money will also be in the mix so the board has to figure out how to fund them with operating budget money beginning in 25 so that's what that 2.5 million dollars reflects and then the uh, cost to reduce or mitigate the fiscal th these are the kinds of things that, that dr mccabe's been been doing so well in the in the town halls talking about she spent so much time focused on compensatory ed because that is the that is the big number that is the the big challenge that is what will drive the changes in staffing and other resources from one school to another and potentially class sizes there's um, three other areas uh, program areas under the blueprint where we also believe we are not technically yet in fiscal compliance which we need to be in by um, by 25 and they're listed here uh, ESOL transitional supplemental instruction and, and pre-k those comparatively to uh, compensatory ed are so small um, we haven't spent we we focused on that example we're aware of these they're they're not as unmanageable um, obviously as the as the compensatory ed and when we talk about staffing i, I know mr shockney would want me to say this uh, another thing that happens is you know the state in the sort of the restricted nature of the blueprint came up with 11 point some million dollars of new compensatory ed money this year and we made the strong case in the decision the board made a decision to spend that compensatory ed money where we know they're going to say we have to spend it because i can't go i don't know how to go back a slide because if we didn't that 37 million on the prior slide would be 48. but in essence what we're doing is hiring our own people for those additional roles that that money is used for and therefore hoping we can backfill all of the positions they left to take those roles in time for the school year that's sort of that staffing churning that we've been talking about, Be Skyler. Before you go to another page, um, a couple questions. One, the, the 75 million, that's additional funds you need from the state and the county. Correct. Correct. And your guess is from the state? So, and Ms. Kyler, I would say from the state and the foundation, because if it's not in the foundation, it's otherwise restricted anyway. So, and we have a, a last slide, but our best guess is going to be 12 million. Okay. Um, so, if you have seven in your plan and, and and anticipated 12 in the foundation from the state, that would drop the 75. The, the gap would close to like 56 million. So, they say so it gets much easier. That's so, assuming <laughs> so, assuming it's totally impossible for us to fund that, yes, it, it ain't going to happen. If you get every waiver. You, des you desire and with no impact negatively to students what could you reduce this to yeah. Yeah. You, you could take yeah. off that bottom section pretty quickly yeah. and that, that, that 60 40 split's going to kill us yeah 60 40 yeah. teaching yeah yeah that 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 too and but that, that bottom those bottom four lines or that last subsection that's why i, I started to think of this as a retroactive law mm -hmm. because you're making us go back and redo our prior school system but if you pass the law and you've been that very said, successful going, with what you've done there's that so we, but if the so law I, were <laughs> as you go forward we're going to give you these buckets of money to use for these specific purposes I, most of us wouldn't argue that those are many of those are very good purposes we would gladly do that we never had the buckets of money to spend there in the first place that's you know whether it's a phase in or whether it's a waiver or whether it's just make it prospective rather than retroactive that that would change okay. a lot of things thank you um, I'm, so I, I spent the time on 25 kind of highlighting what those items were so I'm not going to repeat all of them on 20 um, six and 27 but you, you can see once you get over some of the initial lift then it it goes down from there but again a lot of assumptions here and also not not picture would be if if we have to do that 37 million dollar realignment 
you know, what, the, what pressure does that lead to in the out years as, as people begin to want, want things? We also wanted to take a minute to do a different example besides comp ed and besides not having enough money to do salary, do other things. And because the blueprint can sort of get you on both ends. And when you would say, well, why are some of these other counties that you might not think would be similar to us saying the same things now? This is an example um, why. And I think this would be true for 24 out of 24 LEA, or local school systems in Maryland. Special education. There's your state and local requirement under the blueprint, totaling $26 million. We already plan to spend $51 million on special ed next year. And that's where we've been. That's, I mean, special ed goes up every year, but that's not new or surprising to any of us. And Mr. Shockney would be the first one to tell you we don't believe we've been providing the services we'd love to provide with that $51 million. We, we, we wished it could have been a lot more. But that's $25 million beyond what the blueprint mathematically requires you and the state to contribute to special ed. So what does that mean? From everything we can gather, the state's interpretation is that in an example like this, or anything else for that matter, you would just use the money in the foundation program to pay for everything else. That's that's the unrestricted, if you want, or the you know the freest, most flexible part of the blueprint formula. So let's look at the let's look at the foundation, and I think this would be kind of good fodder for the delegation discussion. So what is the foundation? The foundation is the base per pupil. It's the it's the base targeted per pupil amount times the number of kids you have, and and again the state believes this pays for anything needed in a program area beyond the shares and anything else you need to operate Carroll County Public Schools. So that would be things like that special ed example, pupil transportation, that the, the uh, state only contributes about half of what we actually spend on um, pupil transportation. Certainly some employee comp compensation is flowing through the, the buckets of the blueprint, but not all of it. Um, so there's, you know, there's um, a lot of money that needs to be spent there. Um, our fixed charges, that would be employee benefits, pension, you know, the local share of pension, insurances, that sort of thing. Um, facilities, maintenance and operations, that's not part of the blueprint. Technology, security, and then, you know, back to inflation. Basically, everything else that runs the school system. That money is all being spent already somewhere. And I guess you could argue, is it being spent, you know, correctly or not, but I don't, I don't never see that argument get too far. So there, I guess the point we're trying to make here is when you hear the state say, well, all the other money you need is in the foundation, there is no other money in the foundation that's available for the Board of Education to say, oh, we'll just move this over there to cover that requirement. And just to give you some sense, special ed on that, on that, on those sub bullets, 25 million. Pupil transportation, 16 million, not coming from the state, coming from you. Our total payroll, 240 million. Now again, some of that's coming through the buckets, but not most of it. All the fixed charges, including our retirees, 91 million. All the facilities, operations, and maintenance, 38 million. Technology, 10.5 million. Security, 2 million. There is no free money to shift around. That's why the superintendent is out in public saying, the only thing I can do is move the resources I already have, including my staff, or cut something. We're, we're back to that decade, if that's the case. Those are her. Those are the board of ed's options. John, um, can I ask yep. a clarification question? So, do you think that that's so? Understanding that that's the situation, there's no other flexible money to fund the rest of the school system. Do you think that's a function of how our school system has developed over time, given? financial constraints or is it more a flaw in the logic of how blueprint was constructed I think, I think or both I think it's a little bit of both I think people okay. did not understand how restricted the blueprint was going to be and now they do and I'd, I'd love to take credit for the first thing but it's really Dr. McCabe who said it first and most often but we're all and maybe you want to say it now city we're also in a different place than most other school systems because of the reductions of that prior 10 or 15 year period there aren't any other instructional specialists in central office that Mr. Shockney can move into the school so that he doesn't have to move that teacher from that high school in the southern area. There aren't any other, you know, we cut 300, I forgot what it was, 300, 300, and, positions. 300 plus uh -huh. positions, 229 of them in schools, not all teachers. There's not 
the flexibility left over to make that happen and I don't think other other counties have uh, you know quite that some do like Garrett's does I mean, they're mm -hmm. in the same place maybe worse um, but other places haven't been there and so they do have a little bit more flexibility but at the end of the day it all comes down to local funding whether anyone wants to say that or admit that at the state or not like my final bullet not printed on this slide would be if you want to know where the pressure is on the board of ed operating budget it's in this room that's where it ultimately is um, and then mr. Kyler your question earlier those last three bullets hopefully get to it you know if you look at the chart as a handout you've got about seven million in your plan for the next three years we'd anticipate somewhere around 12 million in the foundation from the state so that's the money that's sort of free to use so that reduces your 75 and the, and the subsequent numbers to 56 10 and 8 so in, in, in three years it, it gets pretty easy yeah but but and, and to piggyback your question when you see and and I guess this is all true you see Garrett County closing middle schools my gosh that's against everything you guys have ever stood for mm -hmm. you see Kent County I think suffering way worse than us how do we get anybody to listen to us I, I think the we're, we're like yeah. always we're in the middle someplace we're not the worst right. we we definitely don't have enough money but two, two things curiously those two school systems you mentioned are two school systems who have long been losing enrollment now we went through that we, we seem to have yeah. are coming back I don't know that they ever are so so they bear that burden too um, and it's dire um, and they certainly don't have the fluff to move around either and I, I don't mean other I mean other other counties don't have fluff they have what we wish we had in terms of additional resources but that's why you see the superintendent south of us in Howard saying I've got to make some changes to my system now because my executive and council can't fund um, right. fund my, my needs and I like that special ed example was intended to explain how suddenly some counties you might not have thought are like Carroll are showing up sort of saying similar things that you, know, you hear from you know, I don't want to single too many out because I hear it from and I know Cindy does from all of our peers so we don't all have the exact same challenge or problem or you you know like for us comp ed is the biggest issue for others that may not be but everybody has that challenge to fund this and the and the dawning realization that the only way to do it is is locally um and and can even the bluest counties do that and it's looking like you know not as no. not as not as sure as it, as it might have once been so i think if you get relief it's probably because in, in their own way most counties most boards of ed in their counties are seeing okay wait a minute this is not exactly panning out to be how we expected it to be. you know on, and on doing it locally if you look at the numbers at the bottom there 74 million dollars I'm not suggesting that this is the path just trying to give context to how big that is uh, everything else being equal we would need a 34 cent property tax increase to be able to provide that much new funding <laughs> and I think the, the more that other districts recognize the challenges and the more we all work with our local funding authorities and our delegations, the more we might be able to get done in the General Assembly. Um, the problem of this is all going to be timing. Um, you know, they don't go back until January mm -hmm. and we have to start building a budget now. And so by the time we know how much, um, how much funding we're going to get um, from the state and then local, um, we're already in the midst of having to make those tough decisions about which staff we're going to have to move from which schools to which other schools, how big the class sizes are going to be in certain schools. We're going to be knee deep in that by the time we have clear concise answers then as we do that um, having planning assumptions by us working together and also uh, us have we as we've committed to looking at our priorities for our community for our county um, whether it comes to expenses and or revenue um, in order to meet those numbers because like now you said this is going to be incredible challenge last budget was an incredible challenge and this is just more daunting because some of the things weren't answered last time and now they're in our in our face 
Um, so the more planning assumptions we can provide for you, the better you're going to be. Um, but that's going to be, you know, a commitment on us to doing what we're doing. Um, and, uh, and even yeah. the ones that sent out emails and pushed, we have to help the school system, we think you should raise taxes, they had no idea the magnitude, and they're not going to say okay to that. that right. I mean, it just, e even the, the slim ones that were pushing to, ra to do raise taxes, not, not that magnitude. Because everyone at your town hall was saying the exact same thing. I'd either pull them out to the side and they'd say, raise tax, do this, do this. Of course, it's because the most precious commodity, the most precious mm -hmm. is their child, and they want the best, which they deserve. Right. Um, and we so. have to think, you know, what, what decisions are parents going to make when, mm -hmm. when they see a class size of 40-some students for their child? Um, you know, will they, will they continue to... Um, have their student attend Carroll County Public Schools? Will they pull them and put them in a private school environment or a home school situation? I don't know, and then, and then how does that affect our enrollment moving forward? It could change everything that we've just laid out um, as to what we expect for the future. And couple that decision with the other two thirds, three quarters of the community that don't, do not have the child in the schools. And are they committing themselves to those children in our schools? Right. So it's it's understanding both sides, and um, I, you know we've we've gone down a road having these conversations. This could take another few hours in doing that. We're not going to do that right now, um, but it's something that we definitely have to work towards, and that's continuing work together. Give you the planning assumptions needed. Us continue to work our priorities. Um, is there? I'm present. Any closing comments for you? We have to work together, yeah. and we're late for our it's next three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I need a and motion. And I thank you all. Because, and then we need to work on dates. Yep. I need a motion and the letter. And the letter. And the Absolutely. Letter. Dates and letter. A motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Hi. <laughs>